from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now today, I want you to turn with me to the fifth chapter of the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel, the fifth chapter of the book of Daniel. I suppose more than any other book in the Bible, this book predicts the future, unless it's the book of Revelation. And when you read the book of Revelation, always read the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel in one hand, the book of Revelation in the other, and then in front of you, the daily newspaper, and they all tie in because Daniel is a book of prophecy. But the thing that I want to talk about Daniel today is an incident that happened in his life that I think bears on what we see happening today in our world. And in this chapter that we're turning to, I won't take time to read it to you, I'll tell it to you. It's the story of Daniel already in Babylon. He'd been carried to Babylon from Jerusalem. Jerusalem had come under the judgment of God as Jeremiah had predicted. All the judgments that Jeremiah predicted, all the judgments that the prophets predicted have all come true or they're yet to come true. They were just in their teens, and they were carried over to Babylon. And Daniel had been one of the young men that had been chosen especially by Nebuchadnezzar to be taken to Babylon and trained in his court and trained in all the arts and sciences of the Babylonians. Now, when this chapter opens, Nebuchadnezzar is dead. Daniel had been a friend and a prophet and a prime minister for Nebuchadnezzar, the great king. But now he's in more or less been forgotten because a young man is now on the throne by the name of Belshazzar, who was the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, the great king. Now, Babylon at that time was the greatest empire in the world. It was the most powerful nation in the world. It was the richest nation in the world. And the Bible pictures Belshazzar, the king, as young, rich, powerful, but at the same time egotistical, self-centered. And the Bible teaches that God hates pride. And Jesus was to say years later in Matthew 23, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. If you try to tell how great you are and leave God out, or if you act as though you can solve your own problems and arrange your own life without the help of God, God says, I'm going to bring you down. And then he was a man that was very carefree. He was a playboy. He loved ease and he loved pleasure. And the Bible says, woe to them that are at ease. We in America are at ease in comparison to the rest of the world. And so Belshazzar had just won some military victories. And his father, who was a great general, was out on the frontiers leading them from victory to victory. And so he decided that he wanted to celebrate. And he decided to have a great feast. And it would be the greatest feast that Babylon had ever seen. Babylon with all of its glamour. Babylon with all of its wealth. Babylon with all that it had. He said, we'll have the greatest feast in the history of the world. So he ordered the finest dances, the finest wines, the best foods, and he sent an invitation to a thousand of his lords and ladies throughout the empire to come. And in their jewel chariots, they came. And that evening, as they were feasting and dancing and whining in the low-hanging gardens that Nebuchadnezzar had built for his Midian wife, one of the seven wonders of the world, Belshazzar became intoxicated. There he was, king of an empire, master of a banquet, the center of all attention, dancing the night away. But the Bible says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Belshazzar, watch out. Judgment is coming. You're going too far. 
There's a point beyond which the patience of God will not go. There's a line drawn among nations and among individuals and in families and in communities. Job said, they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. Keep on plowing your iniquity. Keep on sowing your wickedness. You're going to someday reap it. Hosea said, for they have sown to the wind and they shall reap a whirlwind. Jeremiah said, they've sown wheat, but they shall reap thorns. And so in the middle of this banquet, Belshazzar's dancing with a beautiful, sexy young girl. And all of a sudden, everyone is quiet. You can hear a pin drop. His face turns white. The Bible says he begins to tremble because over on the wall, an armless hand starts writing. And everyone sat there trembling, wondering what this was, what strange thing this was. And Belshazzar tried to read it. He couldn't read the message. So he said, let's call the astrologers and the soothsayers and the Chaldeans. Let's call the magicians. Let's call all the people that can read this type of thing. And they came in. They couldn't read it. Belshazzar was even more afraid. The writing was getting lighter all the time and more brilliant. People were frightened. And his mother heard about it. And his mother, incidentally, was not at the party. But she came in. And she said, son, what is this I hear about a strange writing? And he pointed over to the wall. She said, I know a man that can read that writing. His name is Daniel. He's a great prophet. He helped your grandfather interpret dreams. He was prime minister under your grandfather. He's been living in sort of semi-retirement. Perhaps you don't know him. Daniel was not at the party. But they sent for him. And he came in, and Belshazzar said, Daniel, you see that writing? If you'll read that writing, I'll make you the third ruler in the empire. I'll put a gold chain of authority around your neck, and I'll put royal robes on you, and you'll be a member of the royal family next to me. Daniel looked at the writing, and he recognized it immediately. That was his father's handwriting. That was God the Father's handwriting. And he had studied God and lived with God all these years, and he knew that that was God's writing. He said, Belshazzar, I can read the writing, but keep your gifts. I don't want them. Give your gifts to somebody else. You see, Belshazzar, O king, you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of God's holy house before thee, and you and your lords and your wives and your concubines have drunk wine in them, and God is offended. And thou hast praised the gods of gold and silver and brass and iron and wood and stone that see not and hear not and know not. And the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, thou hast not glorified. Yes, Belshazzar, I'll read it. God had given Belshazzar everything he had, even the ability to laugh. His food, his drink, his power, his riches, everything had come from God, but he hadn't thanked the Lord for it. Daniel said, all right, here's the writing. Meany, meany, tekel, you farson. This is the interpretation. Meany, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Belshazzar, you're finished. Your last day has been spent on this earth. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances of God and found wanting. Paris, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And while they were in the banquet unknown, unknown to the Babylonians. The great Euphrates River was being changed in its course, and the Medo-Persian army slipped under 
on the dry river bed. And that night, Babylon fell to the Medes and the Persians. Belshazzar was killed. Daniel remained and became prime minister in the next empire. Both empires respected him for his wisdom and his faith and his purpose and his godliness. Is God writing on the wall of America tonight? The word many also re means remembered. God remembers. God remembers our sin. God sees our pornography. He sees our obscene films, and he sees these new films that are coming out making fun of Jesus Christ. He sees our lying and our cheating and our corruption that goes all the way through our society. He sees it all, and the Scripture says, be sure your sin will find you out. But he remembers something else, too. It's not too late. God remembers to forget. When any group of people, any nation, will repent of their sins and turn to the Lord, he'll forgive their sins and heal the land. That's the promise of the Lord. Secondly, he says, Thou art weighed in the balances and found one. The Scripture says, Thou dost weigh the paths of the just. The Lord says, By the Lord actions are weighed. All the ways of a man are clear in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the Spirit. The nation, the world tonight is being weighed. You are being weighed in the balances of God. Our sins are great in the eyes of the Lord, and we are being weighed in His balances. And many thinking leaders believe that the handwriting is already on the wall and the judgment is already beginning to take place. But God weighs us as individuals. What's he going to weigh us by? What's on the other side of the scales? You see, here's the scale. Here's you, and here's what God weighs you by. First, he'll weigh you by the Ten Commandments. How do you stand up with the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not murder. All of these are taken in the Ten Commandments. And the Bible says if we offend in one point, we are guilty of all. If you've broken one commandment one time in your life, it's the same as breaking all of them. Well, you say, well, of course I've broken at least one or two of them. Well, then you're guilty of all. And that's the reason the Bible says we're all guilty. That's the reason Jesus said, you that are without sin, pick up the first stone and throw it at this woman taken in adultery. None of these religious leaders could do it because we all have sin. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God and all are under the judgment of God. Then not only are we going to be weighed by the Ten Commandments, but we're going to be weighed by the law of love. Matthew 22, Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments, said Jesus, hang all the law and all the teaching of the prophets. It's all summed up in love. Do you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul? And do you love your neighbor? Now, your neighbor means anybody that's in need. Jesus taught that in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Anyone who's in need, you love that neighbor as much as you love yourself. That's what Jesus said. We're going to be weighed by that law. Thirdly, we're going to be weighed by the person of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Psalm 89, For who in the heaven can be compared unto the Lord? 
Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? Isaiah said, To whom will be likened me and make me evil or equal and compare me that they should be like me? God says, Be ye holy, for so I am holy. If you don't, now Jesus Christ was the only righteous and the only holy man that ever lived. We call some people in India holy men. But Jesus was the only truly holy man of history. And if we don't live like Jesus and live as good as Jesus is, then we come short of God's requirement and God's expectation. Will you say, Billy, who in the world can live like Jesus? Nobody. That's the reason you all have to say, I'm a sinner. God is going to weigh us by Christ. He's going to weigh us by the Ten Commandments. He's going to weigh us by the law of love. But he's also going to weigh you by your works. Those sins of omission that you weren't even conscious of. In Matthew 25, Jesus reminds us, For I was a hungered, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, you didn't give me anything to drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't take me in. I was naked, and you didn't clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you never came and visited me. But the people will say, Lord, where, we, where did we see you naked and sick and in prison and thirsty? Then he answered them this way. Inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. Now that strikes every person in this arena. And we come short. And then Jesus pronounced judgment. He said, those that are guilty of the sin of omission and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous unto life eternal. You say, well, Billy, I'm sort of devastated. How can any of us weigh up? We can't. Jesus said in Revelation 3, I know your works, that you are neither hot nor cold. I would that you were hot or cold. So then because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth, he said. Listen, there are going to be a lot of people that are going to miss heaven that you think are going to be there. And then fifthly, he's going to weigh us by our opportunities. By our opportunities. To whom much is given, much shall be required, he said. Think of living in America with all of its advantages. A church on almost every corner, a Bible in almost every hotel room, millions of Bibles available, the gospel by radio and television. Think of living here. He's going to judge us by the opportunities we had. Think of the Christian literature that's available at bookstores. And we don't take advantage of it. To whom much is given, much is required. You say, well, Billy, even on that score, I, <laughs> I can't make it. No. But the glory of this whole thing is that there is a gospel. And the gospel is good news to people like you who are sitting there saying, well, I'm guilty. The good news is that God sent his son Jesus Christ to the cross to die for you. And God took those sins of yours and those failures of yours and laid them on Christ. He became sin for us. Now he said, the just and the righteous are going to get to heaven. How am I going to get a justness and a righteousness of my own when I don't have any? I'm a sinner. I don't weigh enough to get to heaven. But on the cross, Christ provided a justness for me. He provided a righteousness for me that I didn't have. And I am acceptable tonight by God, not because I've been good or because I've read the Bible or because I've preached to crowds of people. I'm acceptable because of Christ. 
I am accepted into the beloved because of him. And that's your privilege at this moment. You can appropriate what Christ did on the cross to you right now, and you can leave here weighing enough to get to heaven, weighing enough to have your sins forgiven, weighing enough to live a new life. Thou art weighed in the balances of God and found warning. Are you found warning? The last word here is you farson, divided. Thy kingdom is divided. God said, Belshazzar, I'm taking your kingdom away from you. You're finished. Judgment has come. It's too late. Is God going to say that to you? Judgment has come. It's too late. I know people that know that and accept that and believe that and just go on merrily dancing their way to hell. They're like the mouse that's been caught in the trap that's still nibbling at the cheese after being caught. You're still nibbling at the devil's bait and you're already dead as far as eternity is concerned. I believe this crusade has been held at the right time and in the providence of God at the right moment in the history of many of your lives. People have prayed for you. People have worked. People have given to make this possible. And now this is your moment with God to receive him into your heart. To make sure... From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now I want you to turn with me tonight to the third chapter of John's Gospel. This man, Nicodemus, came to Jesus by night, probably afraid of criticism, or he had a desire for a private conversation, or maybe he wanted to give some more thought before committing himself to Jesus Christ. In any event, he came, and he asked Jesus some questions about spiritual life, and Jesus looked him up and down, and Jesus said, Nicodemus, you need to be born again. In fact, he said, verily, verily, and any time that Jesus uses that expression, that means that what is going to follow is very important. He said, verily, verily, I say unto you, you must, you have to be born again if you're to enter the kingdom of heaven. Two years ago when we were touring Poland, while we were there, we met a priest, a monsignor, who is head of one of the largest theological seminaries in the world. And he said, I want to tell you a story. He said, I got my Ph.D. degree at the University of Chicago. And one day, I was riding in a bus, and sitting behind me was a black woman. And she punched me on the shoulder, and she said, Sir, I beg your pardon, but have you ever been born again? And he said, Well, I suppose I have. He said, I'm a, I'm a priest. She said, That's not the question I ask you, sir. I ask you, had you been born again? And he said, Well, I, 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 uh, she said, have you been born again? And he said he went back to his rooms at the, at the university and got his Bible down and turned to the third chapter of John and reread this passage. And this passage spoke to him, and he said he got on his knees and he had an experience with Christ that he's never been able to get away from. Now, he said, my theology would tell me that I was probably born again at a different period but he said, something happened, you can call it anything you want to, commitment, recommitment, conversion, whatever, something happened to me. Now, the question I want to ask you tonight is, has that ever happened to you? Give it some other title, some other name, if you want. Call it conversion, call it commitment, call it repentance, call it faith, call it whatever. Has it ever happened to you? Many of you have thought a long time about religion and Christianity. Are you committed? Are you committed to Jesus Christ? Jesus said, you must be born again. Start with your hearts. Be born from above. You can be changed. The world could be changed. The country can be changed. A state can be changed. A family can be changed. A person can be changed. You can be changed. 
Now, Nicodemus must have been stunned when Jesus said that to him because if Christ had said that to Zacchaeus, who's a tax collector, and they didn't like tax collectors then much more than they do now. But to say it to Nicodemus, one of the great religious leaders of his time, Nicodemus, it says, was a ruler. That meant that he was rich, he was religious, and yet he was searching for reality. How many of you go to church, but you're still searching? There's still an empty place in your heart, and something tells you inside that you're not really right with God. You see, Nicodemus fasted two days a week. Do you know anybody in your church that does that? He spent two hours every day in prayer. How many people do you know that spend two hours every day in prayer? He tithed all his income. Not many people even do that these days. He was a professor at the theological school of theology, and he worked hard at religion. But Jesus said, Nicodemus, that's not enough. You must be born again born from above. Now, why did Jesus say that to Nicodemus? Because he could read the heart of Nicodemus. He saw what was in him. He saw that he had covered himself with religion, but he had not yet found the real thing, fellowship with God. What causes all of our troubles in the world, lying and cheating and hate and prejudice and social inequality and ultimately war? Jesus said, these things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. He said, it's in our heart. He said, our hearts need to be changed. Psychologists and sociologists and psychiatrists all recognize there's something wrong with man. There are many words in Scripture to describe it. There, I'll take only three words. One is called a transgression. Sin is a transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. Sin is a transgression of the law. What law? The law of Moses, the Ten Commandments. Have you ever broken one of those commandments? Then you're guilty of all. It's also the breaking of the law of conscience. Have you ever gone against your conscience at any time? Sure you have. And if you go against your conscience very long, your conscience becomes dull and duller and duller until after a while it's a seared conscience and a dead conscience and your conscience is no longer a safe guide to go by. It leads you astray because you've gone against it so much. And then there's another one, a commandment, law. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and soul and strength and mind and thy neighbor as thyself. Have you always done that? No. Then you're a sinner in need of forgiveness, in need of being born again. And then another word carries with it the idea of missing the mark or coming short of your duty and a failure to do what you ought to do. The Bible says all unrighteousness is sin. All unrighteousness is sin. And yet before you can get to heaven, you must, you must have righteousness. God says be perfect as I'm perfect holy as I'm holy. Where are you going to get that perfection? You don't have it now. Where are you going to get that holiness? You don't have it now. But you can't get to heaven if you don't. That's why Christ died on the cross. He died on the cross and shed his blood to provide the righteousness for you so that he provides you with the right kind of clothing to go to heaven. And the clothes that you must have are called the clothes of righteousness. And that was provided for you by Christ. And then there's another word, iniquity, a turning aside from the straight path. Isaiah said, we are like sheep. We've gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. Now, here in Idaho, I know that I think this is a sheep state, maybe the sheep state in the United States. I haven't seen any goats around yet. And maybe you have goats too. In New Zealand, they cross the sheep and the goats and they call them jeeps. That's a fact. And uh, when we were in New Zealand, I couldn't get over the fact of, of what they were doing. I don't know whether that improves them or destroys them. I don't know. But some of you don't know whether you're a sheep or a goat. Now, you see, Jesus said at the judgment, there's going to be the goats on this side and the sheep on this side. 
and the sheep are going to enter into the kingdom of God. Of course, there he's talking about the judgment of the nations, but it could be applied to individuals. Or it could be that you're a goat, and the goats are going to be cast into outer darkness, the Bible says. But one thing, you're not spiritually. You're not a jeep. You can't be both. You have to choose which one. And if you would like to make that choice watching by television, pick up that telephone and call that number that you see on the screen right now, and a counselor is standing by to talk to you and to help you find Christ as your Lord and Master, help you with your spiritual problems. They're all over the country, so call right now. And if it's busy, call again. They'll be there all evening. If the lines are tied up, keep calling. Don't give up. The Bible says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Thus a radical change is needed by every person. We need those sins forgiven. We need to be clothed in the righteousness of God for the purpose of finding fulfillment in this life, finding something to commit yourself to. What are you committed to? Are you a committed person? Do you really believe in a cause do you really believe in a person that symbolizes that cause? Why don't you make your cause Christ and follow Him? He'll never let you down. And then not only to find complete fulfillment in this life, but also to be acceptable with God, to be acceptable by God. Now, some of you would ask the question, what is the new birth? Nicodemus asked that question. He said, how can a man be born when he's old? You see, Nicodemus, like you and me, he wanted to understand it. He wanted to understand it. Now, I used an illustration years ago that I couldn't understand because I was born and reared on a dairy farm. And I still wake up at night with nightmares doing this way. <laughs> because I had to get up every morning during high school at 3 o'clock and milk 20 cows. And then when I came home from school, I had to milk those same 20 in the afternoon. My father had a small dairy, had about 60 cows that we milked, and then we would sell the milk door to door, have a little dairy truck that took the milk early in the morning. And that's all I remember almost as I was a boy because we worked hard on that dairy farm. But how can a black cow eat green grass and produce white milk and yellow butter? I don't understand that. Well, I'll tell you what, because I don't understand it, I'm never going to drink milk again. I've got to understand that before I can drink milk. I almost quit milk when the cow stepped in the bucket and it just kept on milking. <laughs> I don't understand color television. Do you know that I am so old that I can remember when there was no television? And I tell that to one of my grandchildren, they look at me as though I came out of the ark. <laughs> I can remember when they were, we didn't have any radio. In fact, I remember the first station that came on there was KDKA in Pittsburgh, and my dad had an old crystal set, and he said, I think we've got it, and got earphones, and we'd all stand around to try to listen. The only station on there in the United States. That's how old I am. Well, you can't imagine a world without paved highways. You ought to have seen the two ruts in front of our house that went clear to town. There were only two paved streets in our whole town. Well, suppose I would say, because I don't understand television, how somebody can be in Rome or New York or Jerusalem or someplace like that, and I can see him instantaneously on my set. I don't understand it. I'm not going to watch it. And I push the button to turn it off. I've got to understand it first. Why, well, you'd say you're crazy. Well, of course, I don't understand these computers. I don't understand all these things that they're developing. This whole scientific age has passed me by. We didn't study that in the school I went to. But I accept it by faith. You see, Nicodemus could see only the physical and the materialistic. And Jesus was talking about the spiritual. Jesus said, you must be born again. Now, when he said that, he did not mean that you can inherit it. You cannot inherit it. 
which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Your father and mother can be the greatest born-again Christians in the world, but that doesn't make you a born-again Christian. I can be born in a garage, but that doesn't make me a motor car. <laughs> and there are many people that have the idea that because they are born in a Christian home that they're automatically Christians. Well, you're not. And you cannot work your way alone, not by works of righteousness which we've done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. And then reformation is not enough. You can reform and say, I'm going to turn over a new leaf and I'm going to have New Year's resolutions and all the rest of it. Isaiah said, all our righteousness is filthy rags and rags in the sight of God. If you take a pig and take him into your living room and into the bathroom, give him a good bath, wash him down with some Chanel number no. five, put a ribbon around his neck, bring him in the living room. You say, now I've got a new pig. He's, he's turned into a perfect gentleman. Look at him sitting over there. You open the door, let the pig out and see where he goes. His heart hasn't been changed. Only the outside had been changed. And that's the way with some of us. We've been changed some on the outside to conform to certain social standards or certain things that are expected of us in our churches. And yet down inside, we've never been changed. Now that's what Jesus was talking to Nicodemus about. He said, Nicodemus, you need changing inside. And only the Holy Spirit can do that. You must be born from above. That's a supernatural act of God. The Holy Spirit convicts you of your sin, disturbs you about the fact that you've sinned against God. And then secondly, the Holy Spirit regenerates you. That's when you're born again. And then the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart, to help you in your daily life. You don't leave here alone without any help. The Spirit of God goes with you from now on to give you assurance, to give you joy, and to produce fruit in your life, and to teach you the Scriptures. You can't reform. That's not enough. And you can't imitate. You try to imitate Christ. They used to have, a, there was a book Sheldon wrote called In His Steps, and people thought that all you had to do is try to follow Jesus and try to do the things He did, and you'd get to heaven. You can't do it. We can't live up to the Sermon on the Mount. You try living up to the Sermon on the Mount, literally. You can't do it. You don't have that kind of spiritual strength. I told a story that happened many years ago from a couple in Oklahoma. And they had read about this play in New York called My Fair Lady. And they told everybody they were going to New York and they were going to see My Fair Lady. What they didn't know is that it was sold out four or five months in advance. When they got there, they couldn't buy any tickets. So they said, what are we going to do? Our friends all back home will think we saw my fair lady. We're going to be embarrassed. So they hit upon a good idea. They went over and they bought one of the books that you could buy for a dollar that told all about the play. And then they saw people, they waited till people started coming out of the theater and they saw some of them throwing their tickets aside that had been cut in half. And so they went over and picked up some tickets. Then they began to hum and sing, I could have danced all night, or on the street where she lives, or one of those tunes in My Fair Lady. And when they got home, they were humming the tune. They had the book that told about it, and they had the tickets. And everybody thought they'd been to see My Fair Lady. And that's the way you are. You know the religious language. You can sing the songs. You can even pray the prayers. The only thing is you haven't been to the foot of the cross and been born again. That's the message Jesus was trying to get over to this religious leader. Now to be born again means in Ezekiel 36, a new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. In Romans, Paul speaks of it as being alive from the dead. In 2 Corinthians, he calls it being a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And Peter, Peter says, partakers of a divine nature. 
John calls it passing from death unto life. The new birth brings about a change in the whole philosophy and manner of living. Now, how is it accomplished? What happens? Well, there's a mystery. Jesus said, The wind blows where it listeth, and you cannot tell from whence it cometh or where it goeth. You can see the result. Now, the other day, I did not see, when we had that terrible storm a couple days ago, I did not see the wind, did you? I saw the effects of it. I saw limbs flying by, parts of a roof torn off flying by, the dust going by, the willow trees bending over. I saw the results of the wind, but I never actually saw the wind. And neither did you. You see, the wind blows where it listeth, Jesus said. There's a mystery to it. And the analogy of natural birth, I think, applies here. You see, natural birth is the moment of conception. Then there's the nine months of gestation. And then there's actual birth. Now, you may be in one of those stages tonight. This may be the moment of conception for you. It may be another stage of gestation, or it may be actual birth. Only the Holy Spirit could answer that question. That's the mystery of it. There is a mystery that I cannot explain to you, and Jesus did not attempt to explain it to Nicodemus. You see, that's why we're to come by faith to Christ. We can never understand it. Our little finite minds cannot understand the infinite. Our finite minds cannot understand the mighty God. We come by simple childlike faith and put our faith in Jesus Christ. And when you do, you are born again. But it happens this way. First, there has to be the reception of the Word of God. And I believe that is conception. 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And then in Romans 10, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Now tonight you are hearing, and you're hearing the Word of God, and that's the first step. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching, or declaration, or proclamation to save them that believe. It sounds foolish that men can stand up and use words out of a Bible, and that has power to penetrate your heart and change your life. But it does, because it's God's holy word. This is not an ordinary book. This is a living book, a living word. And then there's the work of the Holy Spirit, as I've already explained. He convicts, and when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. And then he indwells. He changes us. He changes our wills, our affections, our objectives for living, our disposition. He gives us a new purpose and new goals. Old things pass away and everything becomes new. And then he indwells. Know you not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Does God the Holy Spirit live in you? If there's a doubt about it, pick up that telephone if you're watching by television and call that number. And a counselor will be there to help you to make sure that you have been born again. You remember the story in the Bible of Naaman? Naaman was the general commander in chief of all the armies of Syria, and Syria is much in the news these days. He was commander in chief. He had everything. The king had honored him. But he was a leper. And he knew that in a short time he was going to be thrown out of the military and he was going to be just a, a person going around with a little bell saying, keep away, keep away, keep away. I'm a leper, I'm a leper, I'm a leper. And he heard a little slave girl from Israel tell about a wonderful man that could heal him over in Israel. And he went to his king and the king said, if anybody in Israel can heal you, please go. And he went, and when he finally came to this man after a number of experiences, the prophet said, go to the Jordan and dip seven times, and on the seventh time you will be healed. He told the servant to tell him that, in fact, the prophet didn't even come out to see the general. The general was there in all of his uniform and all of his men, and the prophet just stayed back in the kitchen somewhere. Didn't even come out and greet him. Just sent word to him. 
And the general turned away in disgust. But one of his captains said to him, or one of his aides said, Sir, if he had told you a hard thing, you'd have done it. He said, Go to the Jordan. He said, Yeah, but the Jordan River is muddy and our rivers are clear. That Jordan River can't do anything. He said, But why don't you try, sir? You're a leper. You've got to do something. So the general went to the Jordan River and he dipped himself four or five times and he said, See, the leprosy is still there. It doesn't do any good. But, sir, he said, Seven times. So Naaman went down for the seventh time, and when he came up, his skin was clean and whole. The thing that had saved him was the fact that he did what the prophet had told him. The greatest prophet of them all is Jesus Christ. And he says, you must be born again. How do you become born again? Repenting of sin, that means you're willing to change your way of living, and you'll say to God, I'm a sinner and I'm sorry. Simple, childlike, and then by faith receive him as your Lord and Master and Savior, and then be willing to follow him in a new life of obedience in which the Holy Spirit helps you as you read the Bible and pray and witness. If there's a doubt in your mind that you have been born again, I hope you'll settle it before you leave here tonight because the Bible says now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. The Bible says, He that hardeneth his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. You just can't come to God any time you want to. You can only come when the Holy Spirit is drawing and He's speaking to you tonight in answer to the prayers of thousands of people in Idaho and throughout the country. Come to Christ tonight. Why do I ask people to come publicly? We've seen several thousand people do what I'm going to ask you to do. I ask you to come publicly because Jesus said, if you don't acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father which is in heaven. He hung publicly for you on the cross. Certainly you can come in front of this audience in this beautiful stadium and receive him into your heart. I'm going to ask you to do that right now. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait on you, but I'm going to ask you to come and stand here in front of the platform. And this is a symbolic act of an inward decision that you're making. And after you've all come, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you and give you some literature. Then you can go back and join your friends. God bless you. It's wonderful to know that tonight can be a night of new beginning for you. You say, well, how? Take a moment to call that number on your screen or to write to Billy Graham tonight or this week. And let him know about your desire, and we'll send you some helps through the mails that will encourage you and help you make your decision for Jesus Christ. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions, I